This is A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. On today's show, I'll have a conversation with world-renowned environmental activist and pioneer of the new economy movement, Helena Norberg-Hodge. But first, the news. I'm Christina Onestead with KPFA News Headlines. The British government has approved the extradition of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange to the United States to face espionage charges. For publishing classified government documents, including those that show possible U.S. war crimes in Iraq, WikiLeaks said it will appeal. Assange's lawyer Jennifer Robinson spoke at a press conference hours after U.K.'s Home Secretary Priti Patel signed the extradition order. He faces 175 years in prison for publishing information for which he's won journalism awards the world over and has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. This should shock and concern everyone. We will continue to appeal. This is not the end of the road. And we will use every appeal mechanism available to us to prevent this extradition. We continue to call upon the Biden administration to drop this case because of the grave threat it poses to free speech everywhere and across the United States. Assange's supporters have said he faces inhumane conditions in U.S. prisons and the death penalty. But U- the U.K.'s Home Office said in a statement, courts have not found it would be oppressive, unjust or an abuse of process to extradite Mr. Assange. Assange's supporters also say they have proof the CIA sought to assassinate him while he was in the Ecuadorian embassy and will present that in their appeal. Assange has 14 days to do so. The committee investigating the deadly January 6th Capitol insurrection held its third public meeting Thursday, taking aim at a plan to have then-Vice President Mike Pence overturn the presidential election. The committee presented evidence about the plan by John Eastman, Donald Trump's role and its effect on the deadly insurrection. Pence refused to carry out that plan. Christopher Martinez has more. Democratic Representative Pete Aguilar of California summed up the topic of the day. Donald Trump knew he lost the 2020 election but he could not bring himself to participate in the peaceful transfer of power. So he latched on to a scheme that once again, he knew was illegal. And when the vice president refused to go along with it, he unleashed a violent mob against him. The scheme Aguilar was talking about was a plan pushed by Trump campaign lawyer, John Eastman. Democrat Benny Thompson of Missouri is chair of the committee. Donald Trump wanted Mike Pence to do something no other vice president has ever done. The former president wanted Pence to reject the votes and either declare Trump the winner or send the votes back to the states to be counted again. Mike Pence said no. Former White House lawyer Eric Hirschman told of a conversation with Eastman about the scheme. I said, are you out of your effing mind? Greg Jacob was general counsel for then Vice President Pence. The vice president's first instinct uh, was that there was no way that any one person, uh, particularly the vice president who is on the ticket and has a vested outcome in the election, could possibly have the authority to um, decide it. Even now, the committee is warning that the threat remains. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. President Joe Biden is hosting a virtual meeting of some of the world's largest economies to discuss the next steps on climate change. Among the participants are China, Germany, Saudi Arabia, the UK, United Kingdom and the European Union. Science tells us that the window for action is rapidly narrowing, rapidly. Among the priorities are slashing methane leaks and getting more zero emission vehicles on the roads, says Biden. Each year, our existing energy system leaks enough methane to meet the needs for the entire European power sector. We flare enough gas to offset nearly all of the EU's gas imports from Russia. And so by stopping the leaking and flaring of the, uh, this uh, super potent greenhouse gas and capturing this resource for countries that need it, we're addressing two problems at once. In the United States, we're building a nationwide network of 500,000 electric vehicle charging stations. 
But the Russia invasion of Ukraine has scrambled the president's climate goals by driving up the cost of gas, facing political pl- pressure to get prices under control this mid-term election year. He's urged oil refiners to produce more fuel, even as companies say they lack the long-term incentives to do so because the administration is accelerating the move to clean energy. A coalition of environmental groups sued the administration over its approval of more than 3,500 oil and gas drilling permits on public lands in New Mexico and Wyoming this week. The lawsuit blasts the administration for jeopardizing what it calls climate imperiled species. House Democrats Thursday urged the president and the Senate to take immediate climate action with wildfires blazing in the southwest and cataclysmic flooding in Yellowstone National Park. Kelly Fauci has more. Concern for the livelihoods of communities already beginning to be affected by climate change and the uncertain future of younger generations. Doris Matsui of Sacramento said that a clean energy future is no longer an ambitious goal, but a necessity, citing the impacts of climate change experienced by congressional districts across the country. Young people today, they're looking at perhaps how many more years will we have the type of living that we can have today. We need to do this for our children and especially our grandchildren. The stalled Build Back Better Act Legislation contained more than $500 billion to be spent over 10 years to move the country away from a dependence on fossil fuels. West Virginia Democrat Joe Manchin single-handedly killed the legislation in the evenly divided Senate. Some lawmakers have urged renewed negotiations to attempt to enact pieces of it. New York Congressman Paul Tonko said that 178 Democratic representatives recently signed a letter to President Biden addressing the urgency of taking climate action and transitioning to clean, independent energy sources in the U.S. It's time to move. We ask the Senate for action. We're calling on the president to assist in that regard. Our planet cannot wait and our workers cannot wait for the additional union jobs that will come from this equation. Our message is in all caps urgency on climate. I'm Callie Fozzi for Pacifica Radio. U.S. regulators at the Food and Drug Administration have authorized the first COVID-19 shots for infants and preschoolers. It paves the way for Pfizer and Moderna's vaccinations for children ages six months to five years old to begin as soon as next week. A final sign-off for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is expected this weekend. Congratulations to the Warriors. They won the 2022 NBA Finals. With a forecast for the San Francisco Bay Area, cloudy this morning, clearing with sun, high 60 degrees on the coast to 70 around the bay winds up to 20 miles per hour the cooling trend will continue this weekend in fresno in the central san joaquin valley cloudy becoming sunny highs in the upper 70s today the cooling trend will continue at least into saturday i'm christina honestead news headlines returns at noon and four and please join us at six for the pacifica evening news And we are back. This is A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. Elena Norberg-Hodge is an author, a filmmaker, a linguist, and pioneer of the new economy movement. And what is the new economy movement? Well, it's, it's what we've been talking about here on A Rude Awakening through discussions regarding the destruction of agroecology, which is, to me, the epitome of truly sustaining life on this planet. But... We have Miss Helena Norberg Hodge right here with us to give us her description of this movement, the new economy movement that she has pioneered. Miss Helena Norberg Hodge, welcome, welcome to A Rude Awakening. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. All right. So, I mean, there's uh, so many different directions we can go with this. (laughs) Absolutely. Endless, endless. It's circular. It's holistic. Yes. Exactly. It's, it's healing. It's, it's healing. It's going to heal this planet, I tell you. So let's start with the basics. Ms. Helena, um, describe what the new economy movement is. The new economy movement is essentially a multitude of individuals, networks, groups, academics, writers, economists around the world who are recognizing that the current economic system is simply not working. Many of them are recognizing that it's the cause of both social and environmental breakdown. And they are trying in various ways, a lot of it through speaking, conferences, books, meeting, 
to get the word out. But as you know, it's very hard to get that word out in the mainstream. So it's a, it's a multitude of initiatives and they have not yet coalesced into one voice. Uh, we in Local Futures believe that the, the voice that could bring us together is one that insists that the real economy is the living earth, that every single thing we need comes from the water, from the earthworms, from the, in the minerals, it comes from this earth. That is the economy. However, in the new economy movement, there are still uh, men, very often trained in economics, who are not looking so much at that basic reality, but looking at the flows of money and the, the expansion of technology. And I think it's vital now that we really come back to basics, to the ground, and, and to recognize, as I said, that the real economy is the living earth. Now, it's not only the living earth, it's life, it's human beings. So we are in my expanding network of um, people who are talking about localization as the systemic antidote to continuing to globalize the economy. In that network, we are also putting up front and center that we're talking about human beings. We too are a fundamental part of the economy, and we represent an overabundant renewable resource. And this resource of human beings is being ignored, it's being dumped in the favor of using more and more energy, more and more minerals, and now more and more AI and robots to replace us. So we, you know, in the new economy movement that I'm, you know, sort of a pioneer of, is this worldwide localization movement, we are saying, no, get back to basics. Human well-being, ecological well-being are completely linked. We are one and the same, as Chief Seattle told us, as so many people recognize. And yet, when it comes to the new economy, what I, I hope our listeners will uh, respond to is that I believe that there is a, a, a majority of women out there who are not speaking out yet, who are not often sort of daring to look at the economy and to think that they have something to say about it. And what I'm seeing around the world from, you know, from Brazil and Ecuador to Sweden, which is my native country, to Berkeley, where I have spent many, many years and where I was at the university for a while. In all these places, I'm seeing that really it's something that ecofeminists talk about a lot in previous decades, and that is that women have a deeper, more embodied relationship to, to the natural world. And I'm hoping that we are able to discuss that and to support this more feminine, if you like, um, yeah, earth-based Gaian path forward. I hope that doesn't sound too extreme. <laughs> You know what? I, I think extreme is what we need, uh, and I think uh, I think that's a shared perspective across the board. Extreme is definitely what we need um, because, I, and I love the fact that that it is so important. It is so important to get the word out about women, especially the women of the global south and on the continent of Africa. Just indigenous women are the closest things to the earth and what we all need to get back to. I want to bring everybody's attention also, um, dear listener, uh, Local Futures, localfutures.org. Ms. Helena Norberg hodge just mentioned Local Futures and that is, uh, that is uh, the uh, website, localfutures.org, where you can get all the information um, about what we're talking about right now. And I'll just read from the uh, website really quickly. The multiple crises we face share a common root cause, the global economic system, as Ms. Hodge just said. For more than 40 years, Local Futures has raised awareness about the power of going local to restore ecological and human well-being. Rethink, renew, and resist. So rethink globalization. Renew going uh, going local. It rebuilds the local economies and communities and restores cultural and biological diversity. A solution multiplier. And resist, resist 
and that's through activism. That is through activism. So I, it's, it's broken down pretty simply, folks. Localfutures.org. Now, back to and you. can I also say, you know, the resist part, as you said, it is about activism, but it's above all about big picture activism. There is a way that we are overlooking the need to resist through expressions, through holistic analyses that make it clear to people that we don't want to pursue a path that is literally, systematically destroying livelihoods, people's ability to pay just for a roof over their head or to put food on the table. is being systematically destroyed by a path that is creating a madness of enriching fewer and fewer people at the global level. Whereas at the local, regional, even national level, individuals, businesses are being squeezed for taxes and heavily regulated, ever bigger bureaucracy. Whereas at the global level, there is no regulation. That's what free trade is about. And they're not paying taxes. Instead, our governments are subsidizing them. I really believe that this craziness of the global system is something that most people haven't understood. And in my experience, that includes many CEOs. It includes many ministers in governments who are ratifying these treaties, sticking just to a blind dogma about growth, GDP, about trade always being an improvement, more global trade is a good thing. Sticking to concepts and numbers is really the problem. And it's up to us, to, at the, if you like, grassroots, it's up to us. Um, and I see us as being a very large number that's expanding on a daily basis because it's so clear that there's something fundamentally wrong. It's so clear that things are not going in the right direction. So more and more people are questioning and we're urging people to just take the time to step back and look a little bit more deeply and broadly, the big picture, and then to help articulate and share that information. Because as we know, the dominant media is completely linked into this growth trajectory that's taking us in the wrong direction. Uh, so big picture activism is not so much about getting out and marching in the streets or trying to shut down a, a new mine or although of course these things uh, need to be done but i think more important is this big picture activism which is sharing that bigger picture to build up a movement that will be you know will include everybody who is concerned about the state of the world from the person who's only concerned about what's happening in the, in the schooling, what, what's happening there with more standardization, more competition, more bullying, uh, to the person concerned with climate change, to the person concerned with the loss of democracy. There is a big picture out there that can link all of our concerns into a very powerful voice for change. And that voice, once it's strong enough, will not need violent confrontation because it is so clear and it is so persuasive that there really won't be many battles. We need to start regulating at the global level and we need to start ensuring that at the global level the taxes are paid and in the meanwhile we need to look at how um, very inefficient and actually bogus regulations prevent healthy, thriving uh, economies prevent local farms that could provide a diversity of fresh, healthy food at a lower price than the supermarket food, which has been transported thousands of miles, uses chemicals, etc. So there's a way um, forward that is actually very, very hopeful, but the big block is, the, is really not looking at the big picture. Well, let me ask you this, Helena. I mean, you know, you, you you founded this amazing uh, project called the Ladakh Project in 1978, and it uh, countered the romanticized images of the Western consumer culture while strengthening traditional organic agriculture and introducing renewable energy as an alternative to fossil fuel-based development. That was back in 1978. 
since then, uh, the, uh, the, the localfutures.org, Local Futures uh, Project, and we're going to talk about, uh, in the second segment, we'll talk about the Localization Day, which is a big, big deal, which I think is very important that folks uh, engage in that as much as they possibly can. Um, but you have, you're talking about how, how these uh, different portions of the world the economy and the way that we do things throughout the world, and we've got the Western side of things, and we've got the Global South. Um, what and you've spoken to you've spoken to heads of state you've spoken to economists you've spoken to major institutions universities around the world uh, the world bank you've spoken to these folks and what is what is their reaction to i mean they've invited you to speak right they've wanted to hear or they want to hear what you have to say in regards to localization and what that means and, and going back to a simpler way of life. Why are we still where we are? <laughs> well, I think, I think the, the reason we are where we are is that far too few people focused on this area of the free trade treaties. And it all sounded very nice. And when the World Bank and the IMF were set up, um, it was with the intention of integrating economic activity around the world. And so many people, good people, joined this thinking. They, they were very clear about trying to avoid another depression and another world war. And they thought that integrating economic activity was the way forward. So they also brought in this general agreement on tariffs and trade. Now, this all sounds very friendly. We want to have agreements about this. We want to have integration. We want to avoid another war. We want to avoid another depression. So, so much goodwill went into supporting this enterprise. So many people supported the aid packages that the World Bank and the IMF were involved in. And then gradually there was criticism of that because we started seeing that actually this aid really helped, you know, U.S. and other European businesses. It wasn't really uh, creating a better situation in these countries that had been colonized and had their local economies destroyed. But all the time, this sort of, I would say, the blindness to the globalizing trajectory and therefore almost no voice for localization or decentralization was there. And so many people on the left actively, even today, are frightened by the language of local. They are still caught up in looking at global versus local as having something to do with collaboration, with cultural exchange, with cultural, you know, support. And no, what we're talking about here is an economic trajectory. We're supporting a global economy, one monolithic, interlinked, top-down, very tech-heavy, and as I say, it's a monoculture, and it's promoting a consumer monoculture. And with the consumer monoculture comes changing regulations to allow for more and more built-in obsolescence. It includes reducing regulation about how much chemicals have to be tested before they're released. It, so it's a it's this sort of, I would say, this sort of secret in a way, but it's out in the open in another way. Um, I could say that is the number one reason why we are where we are. And unfortunately, as global business has become stronger and stronger, it has shaped the discourse in the media. The media has become, is, is part of global corporate interests dominating the news dominating our thinking. Um, it's part of what's even happened in science that more and more departments have been funded by large for-profit corporations and those corporations have as their number one goal making profit. Now, this is, a, you know, what we really have to look at here. Is this a situation where we should be saying there should be no profit making, there should be no interest, there should be no situation ever where somebody has a bit more than somebody else. We're saying no. We are saying that we see and have experienced in many, interests, in many instances genuine entrepreneurship, genuine 
interest in doing a good job and maybe earning a bit more money and maybe focusing on saving some of that money, that's all fine. But it needs to be within the contours of democratic, accountable, visible structures. And in order to do that, we need to ensure that economy, the global economy, including media and science, are not shaping society and nature, but rather that society with ecological limits and and not just ecological limits the beautiful thing about localization is that it actually allows you to appreciate the incredible wealth and the magic of nature and how much nature gives us sometimes it feels like if you've ever been involved with the small scale diversified farms that are producing healthy organic food you just feel just amazed by the bounty of nature and the beauty of it so this is, this is the way forward, is to understand that one's economic activity, meaning what is this human society extracting from nature and how is it being done and how are the people involved in providing for our needs being treated? What does their livelihood and work look like? So once we get back to more accountable, visible structures, then we're talking about a situation where capitalism versus communism become meaningless. Both of those systems have become too top-down, too monolithic, not able to respond to and work with genuine individualism, genuine diversity, the uniqueness of each individual human being, the uniqueness of each individual leaf, every bit of soil, The magic of life is that every single moment in life is unique. That leaf, your child, the milk on the table, all of it is changing. It's in transition. Nothing remains static. And it's all interdependent. It's a wondrous and magical and rich fact of life. We are not seeing that through our thinking and through our adherence to abstract concepts particularly, specifically around the economy. We are getting, you know, ending up supporting a deadly system. It's deadly. It's anti-life because it insists on monoculture and standardization in a way that that is literally killing off life, as we can see. No doubt. No doubt. Absolutely. It's, um... (sighs) Yeah. (laughs) I just... I'm at a loss for words. It's uh, it just it's so simple. It really is so simple for us to repair what is broken. Um, but it seems that uh, the power, the power, trying to garner the, the the power of the people, it's like herding cats sometimes, you know, because there so many of us are on different rungs of the situation of you know that this 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 societal you know eventual collapse because the way that we this world is turning right now it's not sustainable as we already know and uh it's just um it's really really frustrating it's really really frustrating trying to appeal to all those different layers you know it's like something yeah i you don't, go ahead, go ahead, please. Yeah, well, I think, I think that, as I see it, very few messages that bring a more holistic perspective that looks at the need for meaningful and enjoyable livelihoods, that looks at the fact that small-scale, really, the truth is that small-scale, highly diversified farms produce far more food per unit of water and land. Those farms in order to pay respect to each and every one of those plants, to the animals, to the mixture of life, need more people, more eyes, hands, and hearts to engage with those ecosystems to make them incredibly productive. So we're talking about, when we rethink the economy from the bottom up, we're talking about a way forward that is so positive, is so wonderful, And there are now more and more young people who want to farm like this. However, unfortunately, there are very few 
we're actually looking at the economic system. There's a tendency with the encouragement of the dominant path to focus too narrowly. So in many ways, the mainstream media and mainstream science have been encouraging a more narrow path with greater and greater specialization, getting completely lost in the workings of a highly commercial, competitive economic system that, as I say, is anti-life. So many, many good people are engaged in supporting a path that is actually fundamentally destructive. I can give you, you know, so examples are uh, a scientist from the University of Indiana. Actually, I was going to name her, but maybe I won't because I haven't been in touch with her for many years. But when I met her, you know, she had been a geneticist and been convinced that they needed to, to figure out how to develop a technology to feed the world. Mm-hmm. Feeding the world, how are we going to do it? And, and, it, and I know many environmentalists who became very excited about Monsanto because Monsanto was committed to going away from producing toxic chemicals to producing sustainably for the whole world. Mm. Now, this scientist happened to go on holiday to India and just happened by chance to meet farm organizations that were desperate to raise awareness about how genetic engineering was actually destroying them, destroying the soil, how unhealthy it was, and even trying to raise awareness about actually most of the money that went into genetic engineering was going into finding ways of allowing plants to take more and more pesticides and fungicides, creating tolerance in them. And where were the voices able to say, wait a minute, what's going to happen with that food that has all those chemicals on it when we eat it? And, you know, now we're seeing more about the problems with glyphosate. But what I'm trying to say is that she only by chance got out of the mainstream narrative by going on holiday to India. And I would say everything I'm about is because I happen to be outside, way outside, high up on the Tibetan plateau. I wasn't hearing the dominant uh, discourse, the dominant narrative. And... um, So I think actually that the herding of cats, the terrible polarization that's going on now where people are getting locked into very very narrow and very often, you know, passionate but passionately aggressive positions around veganism, around race, around gender, around rich and poor, and even, I would say, anti-corporate. I'm trying to spell out how Giant corporations are having a very destructive impact, but I know personally many good people working in those corporations. So we have to distinguish and we have to move beyond this politics of identity. We have to start looking at these bigger structures and then it does become so much easier. And I do believe that people are hungry for a view that puts things together and that is encouraging a path that genuinely is in the interest of the majority. You know, talking about having meaningful and more numerous livelihoods, talking about preventing this absurd situation where energy companies are now earning billions, if not trillions, while the average middle class person, I mean, particularly in England right now, is being squeezed unbelievably with energy prices doubling like overnight. And people in the middle classes are talking about whether they're going to be feeding or heating. You know, it's uh, what is going on. And we cannot understand that without looking at the bigger picture. And the wonderful thing is that we can do so without demonizing anyone. It's not a particular, yeah, go ahead. But with that hope, Helena, with with, with that uh, with that hope that we can all work together and I and I believe it is possible I really don't know how because we're talking about uh, pitting hope against greed you know and 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 all the machinations in between right you know you see I actually 
I would say no. I would say that in the dominant, the way we're, we're ending up seeing things, mm. we believe the narrative that says the reason we're still on this trajectory of using more and more resources and destroying the planet is because people don't want to change, because people want to hold on to their lifestyle, they want to hold on to driving their car. And they... Actually, when you look at the real picture, Mm-hmm. We need to be looking at the fact that the majority of people are getting poorer. And once we spell that out and we say to people, do you really want to support a path that makes you poorer and poorer? And you need to look at the real statistics about how the average American had to work one month more per year in order to stay in place between the 60s and 90s. Those those facts, that was done, that was a book written by Julia True, who was at Harvard, called The Overworked American. Never reached the New York Times or any sizable part of the population. And just that fact alone linked to the environmental breakdown. So we're talking about people getting poorer at the same time as more and more resources are being used. I think there is a a picture out there that could bring people together in, as I said, really large numbers. But as long as we believe that the problem is fundamentally too many people and that people are inherently greedy, um, we're not actually looking at, again, some of the facts, which, by the way, I hope you will look at our new film. It's called Planet Local, A Quiet Revolution. And I was so happy to have a long conversation with Gabor Mate as part of our project World Localization Day. And so he's in our film, you know, talking about how in our neurological system, in our brain system, there is no function for aggression. There is no function for that. There is for love, for belonging, for connection. And so once we start seeing that we've actually been duped, we've been told... Oh, we're greedy and aggressive by nature, and it's our greed that's keeping us on this trajectory. When, you know, what I'm saying is, no, it's been our blindness to what has led to the scaling up and ridiculous thing where even Exxon isn't big enough, it's got to merge with mobile, so in a path of merging giants. Right. Who's been supporting that? Not the voter, not the majority of people. And in fact... When I look at who's been supporting it, we're talking about, I mean, actually, my, my experience is that it's people who are not even understanding the consequences. So I think there's, a, there's another way of looking at it out there that is so much more hopeful than, than most people believe. We are on such a crowded planet. We're overpopulated. But guess what? Because fossil fuels and their blind machines created so much damage destroyed so much soil, so many monocultures of trees, of food, monocultural architecture. We actually need lots of people to repair the damage, Mm -hmm. to repair and heal the soil, to cleanse the water. That's the path forward that could enlist us in meaningful work. And I'd just like to say one more thing about that, that just recently here in Australia, we had very severe flooding, very frightening, extreme weather, people having to be, you know, lifted from their rooftops. And and I was so thrilled to see, again, through direct experience, how there were people there, some of them who had been suffering from chronic depression about the state of the world, about climate change, chronically depressed. When they were out there day after day in community, helping people, doing something about this, They were happier than they had been in years. And localization is about a way forward where we engage more directly with life itself, where we come together in community. So it's a way forward which right in this frightening moment can can start leading to a type of healing and joy and empowerment. I am not trying to say that we can change the entire system overnight, but I am trying to say that it's amazing how much is happening at the local level. No doubt, folks. I am speaking with Helena. Oh, my goodness. Helena Norberg-Hodge. And um, folks, if you do not know who Helena Norberg 
Aj is. She is an author, a filmmaker, a linguist, and a pioneer of the new economy movement and uh, her organization, Local Futures, localfutures.org. Um, you can watch some of the films that she has uh, put out with some amazing folks, like she mentioned, Gabor Mate, um, closely affiliated with Noam Chomsky. Uh, I even saw an interview or caught, a, caught an excerpt of an interview that you did with Russell Brand, which was great. <laughs> I was like, this is great. That was a bit embarrassing, I think, that one. But I, I, he is supporting our work, and I, I'm doing another podcast with him in another week. Yeah, he's a, he's a force. He's a force to be reckoned with, that's for sure. But, uh, if, I mean, if you're able to, to talk to him and have a conversation with him and uh, have him follow the line, that's, that's a, there's a lot being said about that. We're going to go ahead and continue the conversation. Forget the break. Um. <laughs> no, okay. Are you sure? So, yeah, I you know what I was saying as far as like with um with hope and greed, that's what we're going up against. So I guess I should complete my thought. Um, hope is a wonderful thing. Hope is, is the last thing out of Pandora's box. Hope is all we've got right now because we are facing some serious threats. If Exxon, Exxon Mobil, whatever they're calling themselves today or tomorrow, what have you, um major multinational corporations like that um, and the governments that turn a blind eye or, you know, want to be ignorant to what they're doing, don't stop and do something, then, you know, that that's it. We're all, it's, there is going to be that collapse of this planet and the greed is where, you know, they're, they're that's all they care about is their bottom line. When these multinational corporations only care about their bottom line, what are they listening to? You know, when someone like you goes to speak with them, when policymakers um, from some, you know, fresh air board of whatever municipality, uh, name your Western civilization in the world, goes to talk to these major multinational corporations and says, hey, we need to cut emissions by this date, this time, by this amount, you know, and they're just giving off lip service. I mean... How, how, how do we turn that around? I mean, what are take us into a conversation that you've had with some of these policymakers, uh, multinational corporations, heads of multinational corporations. Um, do they sit there and nod and say, "Oh, okay, well, thank you, Ms. Norberg. I appreciate you taking the time to, you know, come and eat our croissants and drink our coffee and talk to us about what you believe in." Um, you know what I'm saying? So, what? <laughs> <laughs> what uh yeah what what is it like being amongst those folks that just have this you know this very monolithic perspective on on the world and, and the environment that they live in well i i first of all i should tell you that it was very clear that in the earlier years when i was basically carrying the same message in the 70s and 80s I got to see many more ministers and you know, that's when I was invited into the World Bank and the IMF. And, and then for quite a while, it was very difficult to get a voice in at higher levels. And I also had sort of given up on that. I was becoming convinced that really what I needed to do was to essentially target the environmental and social movements that, from my point of view, just didn't have this bigger picture. So they were even in many ways, opposing each other because the message often from environmentalists was, you know, it's your fault, you've got to sacrifice, don't drive your car. But they weren't looking at the major cause of climate change, which was what the corporations were doing. As they were moving abroad, taking jobs away from America or Sweden or Australia to go to produce in China or Indonesia or Mexico, they were massively increasing emissions. And at the same time over there, creating horrible slave-like working conditions and destroying what had been far more sustainable and, and enjoyable ways of living. But so it was, yeah, so um, there was a period when, when the, in terms of talking to the powers that be, it was, I wasn't doing that so much and also it was more difficult to reach them. Then I would say from about 2008, with the financial crisis, there's been an opening since that time. 
And most recently, I was invited to speak at the Brussels Economic Forum. And there, around the table with a you know Nobel Prize winning economist, with the head of finance in the EU, with a top economist from Harvard, anyway, you know, sort of a high level of um, someone from Unilever. Anyway, there, I say, basically laid out this picture. We are, the policies now mean that we are subsidizing and deregulating global multinationals while punishing every other business with heavy taxes and huge and ever increasing bureaucratic regulation. And this is, you know, destroying the economy for the, for basically destroying the economy for the majority of the human race and destroying the planet. So then the Nobel Prize in the Economist says, do you really think we could get that message out in a democracy? Now, what that question says is that he believes that his promotion of globalized GDP and global corporate growth is actually supporting the voter. He believes that if he were to turn around and say to the voter, well, you know, actually by supporting these global players, I'm making you poorer and the middle class is getting poorer. He, you know, he would not meet with resistance if he said, I'm going to change those policies. But in his mind, he's so caught up in this belief that this is the only way to go. We're keeping the economy going. It's like a bicycle. But if we slow it down, it's just going to fall over. And that's simply not true. So I actually met with Joseph Stiglitz, you know, double prize winning, Nobel Prize winning economist, former chief economist from the World Bank, and a really lovely man who's been warning about globalization and who had just had an article in The Guardian about the problem with supporting this global corporation. But in talking to him, I realized that he believes that GDP has GDP growth has genuinely benefited the majority in China and India. He believes that technology creates more jobs. Now, it, you see, when you're coming from the baseline that I came from, from a culture that was not colonized, people were not driven away from their land, from their soil and their water to produce a range of things for their needs for their food, for their clothing, for their shelter. When you see how that can work, even with, as we might say, no technology, but actually they had technologies, but they were simple technologies that they could build and repair themselves. When you see how well that can work, if you come from a very different baseline. Most people's thinking is starting from after the enclosures, from a Dickensian in London, where people have already been driven off the land into a highly polluted, broken down society, where the social mechanisms, the interactions where people work with each other, all broken, poverty rampant, ill health. And that, we think, is the baseline for the modern economy. I'm moving the baseline back earlier, and then the whole picture is different. Mm -hmm. so, so, so people like Stieglitz, there, or, or these other policymakers there that, that you've spoken to over over the years, over the decades, um, they're coming. They're actually coming from this space of belief. I have I have another question, and then I we, we have to talk about localization day or local day because that's that's like super important, and it's coming up on the twenty first, folks. Again, I'm speaking with Helena Norberg Hodge pioneer period she's just a pioneer just period okay um but helena so okay so these folks are they're 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 they've drank they, they've already drank the kool-aid so to speak right yes and yes so they're coming from this space of actually believing the crap that they're peddling the the, the, the this information this misinformation the lie yeah. that they are doing and this multi these multinational corporations that they work for is the right thing. I want to go back to what you said. I think you said it three times during just our conversation. And I tell you, it's not something that is lost on me at all. And that is the media. You got your Rupert Murdoch's, you got your MSNBC's, uh, and you've got your CNN's, you've got your ugh, Fox. Your giants. Yes, yeah. your giants. The giants, right? And the hegemony of the media constantly feeds us what the ruling class wants us to 
eat, drink, breathe, believe. Exactly. So how <laughs> local day, I think local day should include turning off your television. You know, I mean, it's just, uh, how, how do you break through that line? I mean, you, you've been able to have a sit down and have, you know, decades long connections and, and conversations with, with, you know, folks that work for the European Union. Uh, the World Bank, uh, you've been to the White House, um, and you know that it's the media. I know that it's the media. What is the next step to try to quell that, that negative message, to, to quell that lie, or, or to completely squelch it? Go ahead. Well, I would say again that the, the, the thing is the realization that at the top, People are not consciously lying. And what I, the way I see it is that we at the grassroots who are desperately working to protect the environment, to protect people concerned about, you know, trafficking in children, concerned about, you know, sex abuse, concerned about, you know, all of us at the grassroots scrambling to try to clean up the mess that's created essentially by a monolithic, techno-economic, machine-like system, we are the ones who are going to have to lay out this picture so clearly that at the top they can't avoid seeing it. Right now, it's so easy for them to pretend that they are doing this because the democratic process is pushing them to keep the economy growing. And if we don't look more deeply to see what that means, if we don't look to see even that GDP should be laughed out of the room, GDP goes up. If you and I get cancer and need to have chemotherapy for years and years, it's good for GDP. If you and I decide to stay healthy and even grow our own food, have really fresh, you know, nutrient-dense, mineral-rich food because we look after the soil and make sure we don't put chemicals in there that are carcinogenic. We are being, um, un, you know, we're being unpatriotic. It's bad for GDP. Mm. So in a way, I feel we need to start looking at the enormous potential, which, you know, is, it's huge, is to actually talk to all these people who are working so hard to try to make the world a better place, for us to have a clear message that then cannot be denied. We can't get the sort of obfuscation, which, you know, some people will, you know, some people get angry with me because I sound too kind and compassionate towards the people in power. And they say, of course, they know perfectly well what they're doing. Well, I can't tell you how many examples I have of people. I mean, even people changing their thinking as they went into power. I've known many cases of environmental activists becoming members of parliament and suddenly toning down what they're saying. I've sometimes seen the same person become a minister in a government and become even more blind to what we're saying here. And, and another case I have is a Swedish friend who actually went almost up the ladder in that way. And at her peak, she said to me, Helena, I know I'm not sure I agree with you anymore. And this is someone who'd come to all my talks in Stockholm for years. Then guess what? When she retired, she came back again. And I, it's like once you're in a power position, the heat and the pressure, you're dependent on always on mediated information it's very speedy and i found that too as i went through the world speaking on radio you could have a little bit more time you could spell out a bit of context but the minute you were on television it was rapid superficial sound bites so again what i'm talking about here is yeah it's it's a it's a <laughs> it's a very deep and very broad perspective that if people are interested, I would urge them to come to our website. We have, we're like a library when it comes, we're the library for um, anyone interested in the localizing path for the multitude of reasons I'm spelling out. And they have to do with the actual foundations of where we get our knowledge, how much we respect experiential knowledge, how much we understand that we actually need to slow down and so we do need to turn off the television. 
so we even need to turn off the internet uh, in order to get back to life. However, however, in the situation we're in, I would urge people to keep an eye on the mainstream media. Keep an eye. That's what I do. You know, through my husband, I get sort of secondhand, <laughs> you know, sound bites, summaries. It's uh, safer that way. It's safer. Well, <laughs> but we but we, more, yeah. so we've only got a few more minutes left. Okay. Norberg Hodge, localfutures.org. When she says that this website is like a library it is no lie local futures economics of happiness helena please you got to tell us about local day you have to tell us it's on the 21st of this month of june so 21st tell us about that in our last few minutes go right ahead please thank you world localization day we launched three years ago and we picked june 21st because it's the summer solstice because we're hoping that people will be out celebrating community and their connection to nature it's about making visible and celebrating this amazing movement around the world. Small, human-scale, community-based initiatives all around the world, very often, most of the time probably led by women, but there are so many, they are countless, that they're not visible. We're trying to make them visible. We want all of you to help celebrate them, and we want all of you to join or start some of these initiatives that take us towards a world where both human beings and the rest of life can thrive and flourish. Beautiful, wonderful. Again, folks, Helena Norberg Hodge, this is the beginning of many conversations. I am just so thankful to, uh, to Sophie for uh, sending this press release on what you are doing on Local Day, the 21st, folks, 21st of June this month. Look it up, Local Futures, localfutures.org, Economics of Happiness. This is Helen and Norberg Hodge. Thank you so, so much. And uh, you know what? I don't think you're too nice. <laughs> well, you know, I... You're fighting this battle with love. We appreciate you being on this show. Thank you. Well, I so appreciate you, Sabrina, and, and, and I so appreciate KPFA. And thank God that you exist. And let's hope that everyone out there is supporting this vital... A vital voice towards the path that we're talking about, towards the community-based path that can support all of us. No doubt. Thank you. Many apologies for the sound quality, folks. It is time to get rid of Zoom. So, good people, sign up to see the film Planet Local, A Quiet Revolution, and join the discussion on the 21st at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m., 5 p.m. here on the West Coast at worldlocalization.org, worldlocalization.org, forward slash film. Helena Norberg Hodge, Joanna Macy, and Jeremy Lent, just to name a few. Check it out. And that does it for another edition of A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. A huge thank you to my guests, Helena Norberg Hodge, for taking the time. Time. Banana peel, rata keels on the controls. I'll be back next week, same time, same place. Stay tuned for a rebroadcast of Democracy Now! coming up next. And remember, lovely people, embrace each other as we embrace the mother of us all. Thank you for listening. Rising across America. From the Mississippi Delta to the Apache Stronghold. From the homeless encampments of Washington State to the coal fields of Appalachia of West Virginia. We are the 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country. And we are building the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. On June 18th, we will hold a mass poor people's and low wage workers assembly and moral march on Washington to put a face and a voice on poverty and low wages in this country. Join us in D.C. on June 18th. Visit poorpeoplescampaign.org. Live from Washington, Pacifica brings you the sounds and sights of the Poor People's Campaign beginning at 10 a.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Central, and 7 a.m. Pacific on your local station. Pacifica Radio, building a better world, one broadcast at a time. Please join KPFA for a very special matinee Zoom event on Sunday, June 26 at 5 p.m. when we welcome delegate Danica Rome and her new book, Burn the Page, a true story of torching doubts, blazing trails, and igniting change in conversation with best-selling author Charlie Jane Anders, host of the award-winning podcast, Our Opinions Are Correct. 
An inspirational memoir meets manifesto by Danica Roem, the nation's first openly trans person elected to U.S. state legislature. Burn the Page is a colorful, no-holds-barred account of Roem's life and political work, which delights for its unabashed candor. An inspiring story of self-acceptance and determination. Tickets to Danica Roem and Conversation with Charlie Jane Anders on Sunday, June 26th are available at eventbrite.com or by visiting kpfa.org slash events. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org.